Um, first of all, let me thank once again the Society for Asian Art for the invitation and this time to become the instructor of record. Um, I hope I live up to the expectation. Um, and by extension, I hope I bring no embarrassment to its co-chair. So thank you so much for, for having me. Oh, sorry. So probably strike one against me is the title. <laughs> a bit convoluted, perhaps. Uh, maybe a bit academic. Um, and the funny thing happened is when I was checking the slides, I realized that the parentheses were in the wrong spot. So I had uh, imminent instead of imagining. <laughs> Um, and then also what happened, uh, and I didn't pay close attention to this, uh, there was a typo in the, the, the title of the Arts of Asia Lecture Series, so I had des Desert Encounters, <laughs> which actually is far more appropriate. <laughs> um, this month spent in China and Mongolia, there were many desert encounters, uh, and they led to a lot of cultural exchanges. Uh, so maybe I should have just kept that title instead of... Uh, going back to desert uh, encounters. Um, yes, it's a convoluted uh, title, uh, but what I simply wanted to address was the idea that the Silk Road is usually represented or reproduced by a particular set of images, and that those images are really based on how we have come to imagine the nature of this Eurasian trading network. So where did the term really originate? What do we mean when we say Silk Road? So it's important to understand that the, silk, the term Silk Roads, Silk Road or Silk Roads, plural, did not exist before the 19th century. But it really dates back to the time of the so-called Great Game. Uh, the Great Game uh, was a term coined by this very handsome man in the corner, uh, Arthur Connolly, who was a British intelligence officer employed by the British East Asia Company. And he used the term to refer to the battle of, for territory and influence uh, between Tsarist Russia and the British Empire. So Britain, uh, the British Empire, and Tsarist Russia initially battled over Afghanistan. Many of you may know this. Uh, Britain invaded uh, several times in the latter part of the 19th century. Russians advanced on northern Afghanistan. Uh, confrontation was avoided by signing of a peace treaty, but then they started battling over Chinese Turkestan, the area that is today known as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Province. Uh, the British were convinced that the Russians might advance through the Pamirs, and in the latter part of the 19th century, surveyors were sent um, into uh, this area to check out the passes. It was only resolved in about 1895, uh, but there was a lot of spying going on uh, in this area, and each, uh, the, the Russians as well as the British, had consulates in Western China. So Central Asia was really, for a long time, wedged between this Russian bear and the British lion. Now, colonial control of Central Asia brought the development of Oriental studies uh, in Europe. And this was supported by the work of a lot of scholars, Russian, French, German, British, uh, who, went to, who went and worked in Asia. And it was in this context, really, that the term Silk Roads was invented. Uh, and it was based on China's, what was thought to be China's main commodity. And it was invented by this German geologist. Uh, his name was, as you can see from the slide, uh, Baron Ferdinand von Richthofen, who traveled in the Far East as a member of the Prussian diplomatic and trade mission in 1860, from 1860 to 1862. Um, and it came to, you know, the, the term was invented to kind of refer more generally to a trade route uh, connecting China with the West. So over time, many expeditions were launched in so-called Chinese Turkestan that uncovered cave temples, monasteries on the slopes of the Tianshan and Kunlun mountains, uh, sites such as 
Hotan or Hötien in the south, uh, Turfan area in the northeast, and of course the very famous site of Dunhuang, and I'm sure most of you are very familiar uh, with the Buddhist settlement there. Now the early explorers were an interesting bunch. Uh, there was the Russian, Nikolai uh, Presvalsky, uh, who traveled through Central Asia from 1875 to 1880. Uh, he was a botanist, a geographer. He was looking at different, you know, trying to find new species of plants, uh, new species of animals or animals that were uh, unknown uh, to uh, Russian scientists. And he was among the first to report on these temple sites um, that, you, that we now know uh, are located in the Tarim Basin. Uh, this was also the first time that manuscripts uh, came to the attention of uh, scholars. And ultimately for his work, uh, a horse was named after him, the Przewalski horse. Um, and if you look at the, the, the species of horse, it's a type of horse we would now refer to as the Mongolian pony or the steppe pony. Again, he was a botanist. Uh, the earliest scholar or uh, explorer uh, very interested in these uh, monumental remains was uh, a figure named Sven Hedin. He was an explorer and a geographer, and he planned a series of expeditions to check out these, you know, these monuments that were referred to by these earlier um, scholars. Um, Sven Hedin had studied with Ferdinand von Richthofen, so he was very familiar with uh, this idea of the Silk Road, and that was really his starting point for his exploration. Um, he went both to Russian Turkestan, as well as Chinese Turkestan, and I'll get to sort of the, 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 the cultures of the Silk Road in a, in a little bit, so I'll explain sort of this idea of, of a land of the Turks a, a little more in depth um, in a couple of minutes. So he went to Russian Turkestan, which was under control of the Tsarist uh, regime, and he also went to Chinese uh, Turkestan, modern day Xinjiang, and he mapped more than 6,500 miles of territory. Uh, he didn't get a plant or an animal named after him, species. Sweden did honor him by putting him on a stamp, uh, a one kroner stamp uh, issued by the, by the Swedish government. So again, a recognition of the importance of, of these European uh, explorers. Uh, Sven Hedin's work then inspired many more uh, European scholars, including the most famous one probably in particular in relation to the exploration, early exploration of the site of Dunhuang, uh, Oral Stein, Mark Oral Stein. Um, he was an Anglo-Hungarian scholar, an archaeologist, the first true archaeologist, who was a member of the Indian Archaeological Survey, so he was employed by the British government. Uh, in 1900, inspired by all the work that Sven Hedin did, uh, he sets out on his first expedition to, into Central Asia. These are the photographs uh, from that time. Uh, I wanted to show you the, the one on the left. Uh, these are all the paintings that were cut out of uh, the sites. Uh, this one uh, was an expedition in Miran. I'll mention the site in a minute. Uh, nicely squared or rectangle. <laughs> cutouts of the murals that were then put in crates and then left for New Delhi and also the British Museum. And so he's not, you know, in China there are mixed feelings about him. Uh, his surveys uh, are fantastic uh, despite uh, his approach uh, and he produces the first accurate maps of the region. He traveled all around the Taklamakan Desert. This is, you know, his map um, through the Taklamakan Desert all the way to Dunhuang, and then determined that Dunhuang had been the westernmost extent of the Great Wall. So Dunhuang, he sort of imagined Dunhuang as being this frontier town, the frontier town wedged between Chinese Turkestan or Central Asia and China. He explored a number of the, the cave temples uh, at the site. Uh, and in one of them, 
uh, in the so-called very famous uh, Dunhuang Library Cave, 16 and 17. 17 is the library cave. Uh, he located or discovered um, thousands and thousands of ancient manuscripts uh, in manuscripts uh, connected to various religions and written in many, many different languages and scripts. These had been preserved for almost 800 years at that time. They were sealed up sometime in the 11th century. And so this was a very, very big, quote unquote, discovery for uh, European scholarship. Many of those were brought back to the British Museum. So now the British Museum has the largest Stein collection. And again, vis-a-vis -vis China, this is a complicated uh, and contentious uh, issue. This is an old photograph from that time, and you can see the, the manuscripts stacked up. There's the door to cave uh, 17 on the right, and the manuscripts that have just been taken out. Over the next 20 years, he conducted more than 20 expeditions into Western China. He wrote several books, one of which is the very famous Serindia, uh, and these volumes uh, are you know, you can, you can get them uh, at, the, at the library. UC Berkeley Library has uh, a set. Um, and despite sort of the, the political context in which these explorations took place, I think for us archeologists, it's still a, a, a resource, a very important resource. Uh, a lot of these sites that Stein mapped uh, are no longer visible in Xinjiang, and that has nothing to do with Politics, it has to do with climate change and desertification. Uh, so uh, many of the sites that are on that map, uh, scholars today have tried to locate them in Xinjiang and can't find them uh, because they're covered basically by, by the desert. So still uh, a, a very important uh, source for scholarship on Central Asia and the Silk Roads. We can go on and on about all the other scholars that worked in, in Western China and, and Russian Turkestan. Uh, very famous ones are the Sinologist Paul Pelio. Um, he explored a number of sites uh, in the Taklamakan Desert area, including Dunhuang. Uh, he too uh, grabbed some of the manuscripts from Dunhuang and took them to Paris. So they're in the National Library or the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris. Uh, Germans worked uh, in uh, uh, Chinese Turkestan as well. Albert von Lecoq, Albert Grunwedel uh, excavated sites such as, uh, or explored sites such as Kucha uh, with the very famous Buddhist monastery of Kizil. Uh, Monica Zinn, in a couple of weeks, she'll be talking about Kucha and, and Kizil. Now, were there others? Of course there were others. I wanted to focus on the Europeans, not because I'm terribly Eurocentric, but in terms of understanding where that term comes from, it comes from this context, this European exploration, and how sort of the East was imagined vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West uh, in the scholar's eyes. Uh, but I'll mention uh, Count Otani. The Otani collection is very famous in Japan. Uh, he also went to, to Chinese Turkestan and, and took, took back some objects that he found uh, or discovered at, at several sites. And then Americans were there too, Langdon Warner. Uh, he's always mentioned in the context of Indiana Jones, that somehow Indiana Jones was based on, on him. He was the last probably foreign scholar to work in China. Uh, and he worked on behalf of the Cleveland Museum of Art. So some of the objects there come from that that time period. Uh, after that, basically, uh, um, China shut down foreign explorations uh, in, in Chinese Turkestan and ultimately would take over, once the People's Republic of China was declared, take over archaeological research and protection and preservation of those, those sites. Um, the report, so many of these scholars left reports. These reports are very, very important, but they also give us a glimpse into the quote unquote colonial mindset when it came to the cultures of Turkestan. And many of them conveyed uh, the racist attitudes of the time. Sven Hedin was a famous Nazi. 
later, later on in life. And they really had a very, very low opinion about the Turkey cultures that they encountered. So they loved the old stuff, but they hated the contemporary stuff. Nothing could match up to what the region had been in ancient times. Inspired by the classical world, connected to the classical world, even the Buddhist world was, in their eyes, informed by the classical world. So when, and, and these reports are full of these sort of contemporary encounters, and he, you know, Stein in particular, does not look uh, favorably upon uh, the local population, and in particular is very disdainful of the Islamic uh, religion that he encounters. Um, I just give you a, a, one quote uh, from his um, work, from Stein's work, and, and, and I think it encapsulated encapsulates sort of the attitudes of the time. I feel I am on classical soil and enjoyed every minute, right? That's what he said of Miran when he encountered these third century CE uh, frescoes that he connected with Gandhara and then by extension with the classical world. So he was, he was in heaven, right? Um, so the archeological evidence in their mind uh, and in particular the connection to the classical world or Europe, suggested to early scholars a direct overland link between China and the Mediterranean. And this link would then funnel commodities, it would funnel people, it would funnel ideas uh, from when one end of the network to the other. And so at that time, 19th century, early 20th century, this was how the Silk Road was imagined. One nice road, two branches along the Taklamakan Desert where everybody had found you know, all these monuments, and then a straight line to the Mediterranean. And really what they were focusing on was all the stuff that was going west-east, right? The idea that the west innovated the east, so brought classicism, right? brought uh, enlightenment to a rather static east. Uh, is, is the flavor that you get from this, these reports. So over time, we've backed away from this romanticized idea of a single road connecting China to Rome. And that idea has given way to a more complex understanding of the Eurasian trading networks, right? This is now maritime step, um, overland going in many, many different uh, direction. In my opinion, though, the Silk Road is still too often deployed in a very monolithic way. Uh, it's, and that is often underscored by phrases like from China to Rome or east-west exchanges. Right? We still see it as a, quote, nexus of trade and cultural exchange stretching all the way from the Pacific to the Mediterranean from the first millennium BCE almost up until the present. Um, what I would argue, and I I've, think I've mentioned this in, in another lecture, but maybe not uh, during the Arts of Asia lecture series, is that the reality is that our imagined Silk Road is really a patchwork of networks. And I think it would behoove us to have that approach when thinking uh, about this construct. It's a patchwork of networks that functioned independently in space and time, while at the same time intersecting in meaningful ways, moving goods, peoples, and ideas, right? Patchworks that included the grasslands, it included maritime routes. Um, and so this is really, for, the, for example, uh, in the first to third century CE, these are all the networks, right? It's not just one person or one community going from the Mediterranean to the east and coming back. These are the networks and you can see that they intersect, right? So stuff still moves, but it doesn't quite move the way we think things move along the Silk Road. And I think that is very important. And now, you know, we're working much more. We just had a, a conference in the spring on, on, on this very issue, uh, looking at the maritime uh, Silk Road. Uh, and it's very important to sort of uh, publish articles on all these different networks and, and, and analyze, you know, how, what was the reality 
on the ground, rather than having this very romantic kind of sense of you know, East connecting with West. Now, at the heart uh, of the so-called Silk Roads, the imagined Silk Roads, lies a particular network that for a long time uh, was dominated by merchants from Central Asia. Let's call it the Central Asian network. And this is the network really um, that is the focus, or that I imagined to be the focus of this fall's lecture series. Um, Where and what is Central Asia? Uh, it's no longer a black hole. It was decades ago. Remember when the Soviet Union fell and all of a sudden everybody was like, what now? What is this? Uh, who? You know, I remember early lectures people were, you know, no, it was really sort of the periphery of the Soviet Union, a periphery of China, and nobody really paid much attention to it. Um, so even though it's not a black hole anymore, it's still a somewhat unknown area, I think, in Asia, and not very often covered in the Arts of Asia lecture series or any other uh, series on Asian art. Uh, the focus tends to be on China, Korea, Japan, India, the so-called, you know, I would say great civilizations paradigm. Uh, and Central Asia, this region gets neglected quite a bit. Uh, so this fall is really trying to put Central Asia on the map. And uh, what I wanted to do today is put Central Asia in a context that will permit you, I hope, to comprehend more easily the dynamics of those desert encounters that are mentioned in the title. So let's talk about Central Asia. Uh, and hopefully I don't take too long talking about Central Asia. Um, it's, it's also a constructed term. Uh, there are many different terms that, that are used that deal with roughly the same area. So some people use Inner Asia, other people use Central Eurasia. Um, it's a term also coined in the 19th century, um, Europe, uh, but which has developed with no clear physical distinction. So for example, uh, and this is not to bore you, I think maps are very interesting and, and kind of uh, often define how we see and how we imagine certain areas. So for example, if you go to old Russian sources, Middle Asia is used for the western part, Central Asia is used for the eastern part. You go to the French sources, L'Asie Centrale, it's just the other way around. L'Asie Centrale is the western part, and Upper Asia, or Haut Asie, uh, is used for the eastern part. So nobody has a clear definition of what Central Asia is. Um, to further illustrate this, I'll just give you a map. This is from Wikipedia. And it gives you all the different configurations of Central Asia, or how dif in different ways Central Asia is imagined. So the official Soviet definition, I don't, the, the darkest part, are the four Central Asian stands. And you want to go, well, why not Kazakhstan? There are five Central Asian stands that were created during the Soviet Union. Well, because in so the Soviet Union thought Kazakhstan was the near abroad. It was part of Russia. And so they didn't want to define uh, Kazakhstan as part of Central Asia. It also was the richest, it had the best ores, the mining, and the largest population of Russians living in Central Asia. The common modern definition, so if you use Central Asia at Berkeley, for example, uh, it will be in the context of political science. And then it's the five former Soviet republics of, uh, of uh, Central Asia. But if you, like I do, look at culture as not defined by modern political boundaries, then you have to have a much broader idea of what this re region entails. So in that sense, it would be more in line with the UNESCO definition. If you look at the area linguistically, if you look at the area, so culturally, in terms of religion, these borders do not make sense at all. And looking at this area from that perspective, 
from this 20th century perspective does a disservice to understanding what this area is about. So for example, if you look at Western China, don't look at it from the lens of the history of China. It's a Central Asian region. It makes no sense to look at it or understand it or analyze it from a Chinese perspective. Um, but then again, uh, in terms of our, uh, the lecture series, or this fall's lecture series, uh, these are the countries that will be addressed. So the countries of former Soviet Central Asia are Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. But we'll also talk about Afghanistan, which in my opinion is definitely connected to these regions. We'll talk about Xinjiang and Tibet, and we'll also talk about Mongolia. So again, this, is, this was kind of the vision for this, this lecture series. You know, how can we talk about this area without always talking about it from the perspective of the so-called great civilizations? So if you move away from China, move away from India, move away from Persia, right? And then the modern period, Russia, how do we look at this area from within? And what kind of topics can we cover to really bring this area into the light? So away from that black hole status. So that's really what we're, what we're or you know, um, this collective this fall is trying to do. Now this is the first lecture. Um, so what I thought was important uh, for me is to give you a bit of cultural and historical background to this region. Um, referencing all these various topics that will be addressed. So that way there's really a red thread from the get-go. You understand how all these topics that are really separate, that could be separate topics, are linked and kind of bring to light the very, very rich cultural heritage of this, this region. Um, so let's talk about Central Asia, uh, culturally, geographically, in terms of subsist subsistence patterns. Um, so the territory of Central Asia, as defined just now, falls within the confines of two broad climatic zones. You have the grasslands, the steppe lands, which you see in green on this slide, um, in the north, and you have desert and mountain, area, mountain regions, mountain ranges in the south, denoted in red roughly. Um, I did this freehand, so it's not quite perfect. Uh, due to the distance uh, from open sea, much of this region, uh, save for the very fertile belts in the north, is extremely dry. There's very, very little precipitation, and what precipitation falls, falls as snow, usually in the mountain areas in the mountains, uh, and that snow, when it melts in the spring, feeds the rivers that provide for uh, the agricultural uh, production uh, in the south. Now, to some degree, and we're talking about culture, this physical and climatic configuration has largely determined the nature of pre-19th century settlement patterns in the region. So what you have in Central Asia, and this is very, very important to understand when we think about the Silk Road, is this pastoral nomadic component of the grassland. So you can't do much in the grasslands. You can't grow anything. Humans don't eat grass. Animals do. And so for a couple of thousand years, uh, say roughly from the start of the first, turn of the first millennium BCE, these grasslands were inhabited by pastoral nomadic groups. So the grasslands, the higher mountain elevations were populated by uh, communities that migrated with their herds and lived off um, uh, herding. Now in the south, you have oasis settlements. So the Tarim Basin, you know, all those sites that we know, Kucha, Khotien, Khotan, Turfan, all had agricultural based economies because the rivers came down there and the desert has a very fertile soil. So if you put water to it, you can make things grow very nicely. 
So you have this pattern. Uh, it's not mutually exclusive. Uh, Archaeology has shown that there's plenty of mixed economies in Central Asia as well. And these economies are very fluid. So when your herds get decimated, a lot of pastoral nomad, nomads sedentarized, and uh, vice versa. When drought cut into agricultural production, uh, some communities were pushed with their animals into the grasslands to try and live off this particular subsistence pattern. Um, why is this also important in terms of understanding Central Asia today? When you go to Kazakhstan, when you go to Mongolia, right, the areas that encompass the grasslands of Central Asia, pastoral nomadic identity is still very, very prominent. I was just in Mongolia. Everywhere in the capital you have images of Genghis Khan as the father of the nation and references to a nomadic identity. And that sets, to some degree, Kazakhstan and Mongolia apart from places like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, where that nomadic, there's no nomadic connection, or if it is, it is not emphasized, right, culturally or nationally. Now, um, just, I wanted to throw a, a, a quote out there, um, and I'll revisit that quote uh, in uh, a little while. Um, it's, a, it's a quote defining Central Asia, and I think it encapsulates perfectly what we're going to try to do this uh, fall. So Central Asia being the Westo, Western Turco-Iranian part of the inner Asian heartland whose indigenous populations consisted of various Iranian peoples, most of whom have now been Turkicized and whose growing Turkic population has to various degrees assimilated its indigenous Iranian culture. Gradually incorporated into the Islamic world, it is set apart from its Islamic neighbors by a unique blend with the world of nomads. So you have Turkic, you have Iranian, you have pastoral nomadic, and you have sedentary. And those are the components when you try to understand sort of Central Asia culturally. These are the important sort of elements that you need to sort of think about. The quote is by Yuri Bregel, and I don't know whether anybody knows uh, of Yuri Bregel. Uh, he was trained uh, uh, during Soviet times. He was trained in Moscow. And he ultimately comes in the 80s to Indiana University. Uh, and Indiana University is now, the, has been for a number of decades since Yuri started there, uh, the center for, for Central Asian studies or Central Eurasian studies. He was the director, the first director of Indiana University's Research Institute for Inner Asian Studies and also then became the director of Indiana University's Inner Asian and Uralic National Resource Center uh, from 1989 to 1997. He was a historian of Islamic Central Asia and was very interested in sort of the, 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 the cross-cultural setting of the area. All right, so um, I, I'll take about 10 minutes to, to start talking about uh, you know, how to look at Central Asia culturally. Because you're going to get, uh, you, you, you will hear a lot of terminology this fall. And you know, in the back of my mind, I was wondering whether you would all be familiar with that terminology. So it might be uh, good for me to talk a little bit about the terms that I just threw out, Iranian, Turkic, uh, et cetera. Um, So one of the problems uh, studying Central Asia uh, as a particular region within Asia or Eurasia is that it's probably the most diverse <laughs> linguistically, culturally. Uh, to be a true Central Asianist like Yuri Bregel, I would say, you would really have to speak multiple languages, modern languages, and you'd also have to know quite a few ancient languages. And these include languages that we normally don't study, right, uh, in the kind of area studies paradigm. In China, you study chi Chinese, but you can't really look at Western China unless you know Uyghur, right? Um, you'd study Russian, sort of, in, you know, looking at the Soviet Union, but you won't understand Kazakhstan, 
Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, unless you know these Turkic languages. Uh, you can't study Afghanistan without knowing various Iranian, <laughs> Iranian languages. Right? So it's a very difficult, if somebody w tries to kind of focus on this entire area, it's just very, very complicated. But I'll try to do my best to kind of just present a canvas, sort of a cultural canvas of the region. So when you go to Central Asia today, a majority population speaks Turk a Turkic language. And this is a map of the modern Turkic languages. Um, so you have in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Xinjiang, and you look at uh, sort of the circumpolar regions uh, up north and modern day Turkey, Azeri in Azerbaijan. These are all part of the Turkic language family. Um, so Uyghur, for example, uh, we tend to think of Uyghurs as kind of part of China and there's this border, right? So if you do research on, on the Uyghurs, you kind of focus, you, you take that perspective. Well, Uyghur and Uzbek are almost identical or very, very close. That border makes no sense <laughs> culturally. Um, so they're Turkic languages. And then you have Iranian languages. So when you look at Afghanistan, you have Pashtun, of course the national Dari. And you look at uh, Baluchistan, you have Baluchi, all part of Iranian language family. Um, there's a, part, uh, a, a, a point in, in Western China, in Xinjiang Uyghur pro province, that's called the Tajik Autonomous Region. It's a very tiny area where inhabited by Tajik communities who still speak the Tajik languages. And they're very much connected linguistically at least to the Tajiks, right? That were incorporated into uh, the Soviet Union and Russia. So today, majority Turkic with a few areas where you have Iranian languages. In the past, it was the other way around. Who knew that the dominant languages historically in Central Asia were Iranian, uh, denoted in green here. So the earliest settlements in Central Asia were Iranian. Uh, Bactrian, you all know Bactrian, right? Uh, Sogdian, but also in China, Khotanese. In the oasis state of Hötien or Khotan, that's an Iranian language. <laughs> so I'll give you a couple of examples. In Dunhuang, you can find a Chinese Hotanese phrase book. It's the lonely travel guide of ancient times. So, for example, you can learn to say things like, where are you going? How do you, do you know Chinese? Could I buy vegetables? And Hotanese. And, and this is where I didn't want to talk about alphabets because that just complicates matters even more. Khotanese is written in Brahmi script. It's an Indic script. So unlike Sogdian, so they're related languages, they're written in different scripts because they were connected in different ways culturally. So there was an input this from India into the southern Silk Road areas. And in Sogdiana, there was much more a connection to the larger Iranian and Near Eastern world. So majority Iranian languages in Central Asia, uh, except for, of course, Mongolia and, and Tibet. Tibet is Sino-Tibetan language, and Mongolia actually is part of the Turkic language family tree, but linguists often consider it somewhat separate. So what happened to all of these Iranian languages? Why are they now all of a sudden the minority languages in, in Central Asia? What was that history? Well, it was the expansion of the Turkic communities. So starting fourth, fifth century CE, really, from the Altai region, so on the edge of the Mongolian plateau, the Mongolian Altai, you have the movement out of Turkic speakers. And basically, these, this slow expansion of these Turkic-speaking communities pressured the Iranian communities in Central Asia. 
Some were pressured to migrate themselves, and some were absorbed by these new Turkic, you know, new Turkic configurations. So over time, this is what the, the quote by Yuri Bregel, right? You, you get Turkification of Central Asia. You get the expansion of the Turkic language, so that now most of the languages spoken in this area are Turkic. And I give you a very nice example from the 9th to 13th century. This is an old Turkic uh, manuscripts that was, was discovered in, in Turfan, uh, in Xinjiang, uh, and it's written in uh, Uyghur script. So just to give you a table in case you want to write things down. So the languages of the Tarim Basin in the first millennium CE. So you have the branches of the Indo-European languages, so Indo-Iranian branch. There's some Gandhari manuscripts in the Tarim Basin, but no speakers of Gandhari. These are manuscripts that came with the expansion of Buddhism. And then you have Iranian, you have Bactrian, you have Sogdian, you have Khotanese. You also have a European branch called Tokarian in the area of Kucha, and I think Monica Zinn will talk about that. And then later you have the expansion of the Turkic languages, in particular Uyghur. And then still later you start to see Chinese and Tibetan come into the uh, region. So linguistically, and I hope I'm not sort of making it too complicated, but I think it's, it's very important because these are some of the sites that uh, scholars are going to be talking about and to understand sort of how, you know, what these, this, this cultural sort of um, landscape of the area is, I think it will help contextualize some of, some of the information. So moving, if you, if you just move away from language and think about religion, in Central Asia, and this is a terrible map because it's a very monolithic map, right? There's no variation in that map. It just takes, you know, majority religions in one area and gives it a color. Uh, but it's instructive in terms of understanding Central Asia. Most of Central Asia, outside of Mongolia and Tibet, is Muslim today. So Afghanistan, the five former Soviet republics, Xinjiang province, uh, majority populations are Muslim. And I know that today, when you look at the demographics of China, somebody will say, but there are just as many Han Chinese in Xinjiang as there are Uyghurs. That's a very recent phenomenon. Historically, it was 85 to 95% Turkic speaking and Muslim, so Turco Islamic. Historically, it's much more diverse. So Central Asia, for example, is the homeland of Zoroastrianism. That is, if you include Afghanistan in your definition. Um, this is a map of the extent of Zoroastrianism. It's often based on the first Persian empire of the Achaemenids, but it kind of gives you in that purple area the beginnings of the, the, the formal, formalized Zoroastrian tradition. Uh, Zoroastrianism, with its rituals centered on sacred fire, it's important to note that Zoroastrians are not fire worshippers. Uh, fire is central to purification and as such is an instrument full of light and good. Um, and so it's an important aspect of the liturgy within the Zoroastrian context. Um, Zoroastrianism, uh, some would say uh, the earliest monotheistic religion centered on the Lord of Wisdom, Ahura Mazda, uh, is also dualist at the same time because it sees the universe as separated into the forces of light and darkness. Right? So um, iconographically, uh, the Achaemenids perhaps uh, re um, depicted Ahura Mazda in this particular way, and then the Sasanians of the um, first millennium CE Persian Empire uh, anthropomorphized uh, much more the figure of Ahura Mazda, so you can see him standing behind 
uh, in front of the king, providing the king with the ring of investiture. Now, Kim Kudela is going to talk about the Achaemenids, and this will all come up, but it's important to understand when I talked about the Iranian beginnings of Central Asia, is that in the Bronze Age already, second millennium, first millennium, uh, BC, you have fire temples in Central Asia. And this is a very famous one in Togolok. It's called Togolok 21. Uh, and this is a fortified fire temple. Do we call it Zoroastrian? I don't know. But clearly there's a link between the early Iranians and then the later Persians that created these large uh, empires. I wanted to show you another one, uh, Tilyatepe, because all of you are very familiar, of course, with the Tilyatepe gold, the so-called Bactrian gold that was exhibited at the Asian Art Museum a while back. Uh, below the famous pastoral nomadic graves that contained all the gold applique was a fire temple dated to the late second millennium BCE. And again, was an important indicator of the, the religious traditions, in particular of the oasis and agricultural communities of Central Asia. Uh, as was brought up, the directionality of uh, the movement of languages or communities that spoke particular languages. So when we use, for example, the word Iranian, it's very important to not think of it as moving from modern day Iran into Central Asia. We're really talking about Central Asian Iranian languages that move south and then west, and then come to be the languages of, you know, for example, the Persian period in, in the Near East. Uh, and also in terms of the Turkic language family, modern day Turkish is one branch of that Turkic language family. And again, it does not move west-east, it moves east-west. Right? So when you look at this map, ultimately the Turkic speaking communities that move out of the Altai mountain regions uh, to the west, so across the steppe but also through the Near East, ultimately settle in Turkey, what is now modern Turkey, and become the speakers of modern day Turkish. So Turkish is a member of the Turkic language family. Uh, which is part of the Altaic language families, right? So that's very, very important, and the terms can be very, very confusing. But think of Central Asia as the place where everything germinates. And so from there, everything moves south, right? Also the Indo-Iranian languages, the Indic languages, right? They enter India north-south. And then the, what become the Iranian languages go south. West. Does that make it easier to, to understand? Yeah, sorry about that. But it was an excellent point that was brought up. So, so Rastrianism, uh, the religion of the agricultural communities of uh, Central Asia. And how do we know that it was really the agricultural communities that, the, the urban agricultural communities that cultivated uh, these traditions, developed these, these religious beliefs is because a lot of the Zoroastrian tradition focuses on harvesting, right? So you can go to the old texts. What was the main focus of concern, right? Having a good harvest, um, being able to connect with whatever the, the, the spiritual pantheon uh, is to affect, right? Uh, the lives of the people who lived in these agricultural communities, starting with the Bronze Age. So Zoroastrianism uh, doesn't spread quite as quickly uh, or goes across borders the same way Buddhism does. It really moves with the movement of Iranian communities east and in other areas. So for example, Zoroastrianism enters um, China, what is now China, Xinjiang, and also uh, uh, areas east of, of Gansu, through Iranian communities, diasporic Iranian communities who settled in China. And the most famous one are the Sogdians, who became the merchants of the Silk Road from the 4th century CE up until the 8th century CE. 
But it's very much tied to birth and class and caste. Uh, very much like Hinduism. So it has a different kind of history of uh, its spread than, for example, Buddhism does. Um, Sogdians who settled in China, this is a, a Judith Lerner will talk about these Sogdians in China. This is a Sogdian funerary monument. And you can see on its panel, the arrow highlights the fire and the priest that stands next to the fire wearing the padam or the mask that all Zoroastrian priests wear so as not to pollute the sacred fire. So Zoroastrianism also goes to China, but it goes to China in a particular way, not quite the same way that Buddhism enters and then changes uh, the landscape, the religious landscape of China. So we have the Iranian communities uh, of the river valleys, but we also have Iranian pastoral nomads of Central Asia, uh, as well as Turkic pastoral nomads. So outside of the river valleys, what kind of religious beliefs did Central Asians have? Uh, what we now think is that most would have probably uh, practiced some form of shamanism. And shamanism is this idea that the visible world is permeated by invisible forces. And it's very important to mediate right, between the invisible forces and the community to kind of change the, the direction of life, um, you know, have an impact on, on the health of your herds or the health of the, the community. And the best people to do that were these learned uh, individuals who were referred to, we refer to as, as shamans. So shamanism is different than animism, although it's very close, this idea of spirit, the spirit world, or believing that, that everything has a, has a, it encapsulates a kind of spiritual entity. Shamanism is when you, when it's, a, it's that kind of animism centered on a particular figure called the shaman. So shaman comes from the Tunguzian word, uh, saman, which just means a person of secret knowledge. Right? He's or she, because they could be both male and female, is important in terms of, again, mediating between those forces that impact uh, life uh, of the community. That's an Altaic shaman. This was taken in the early 20th century uh, photograph. Uh, and shamanism probably was still quite prevalent until the 19th century, and it's really the advent of the modern state, which impacted pastoral nomadism in general, also impacted sort of the belief systems of the pastoral nomads. Um, we can go back thousands of years uh, to the first millennium BCE. We have this archeological uh, remains of pastoral nomadic groups uh, of that time period. This is a very famous burial called the Ukok, Pazirik burial dating to the fourth century BCE. And it contained a female, the body of a female, what most people believe is a female shaman. She had a very tall headdress. It's very typical of the shamanic uh, tradition. So that, you know, through the archeological records, because pastoral nomads are very difficult to trace archeologically because they don't have houses. Right? How do you trace a migratory community? Uh, and the best we can do is look at burials. Right? That's the only sort of physical evidence that we have of that time period. Um, so many scholars believe she was a shaman. She had an important position. She was decked, her clothes were decked out in gold, applique, very important position within society. She had tattoos. Uh, animal style tattoos, which was very typical of that first millennium period. Uh, and that too may sort of connect with the shamanic tradition because in shamanism, the most potent invisible forces were thought to have zoomorphic qualities. And in particular, where multiple animals were fused into one, like a, a, a mountain goat was fused with a feline or an eagle. Uh, and so this may have been one of her, the, the insignia of her, of her position. So shamanism uh, goes back really to when pastoral nomadism develops around the 
of the second millennium BCE. But it is very current in a lot of the steppe areas uh, today. So for example, in Mongolia, uh, even though Buddhism is very popular and, and very important in Buddhism, you still have uh, references to shamanic traditions of the Mongols, right? Either through the ovus, which are these stone kerns that are built on sites that are, that are seen as particularly powerful or where spirit resides. And this is a statue of a Mongolian shaman beating a drum. Um, they're modern shamans. Uh, in Mongolia too, they are now, scholarship refers to them as neo-shamans, uh, sort of post-socialist shamans. <laughs> when, uh, you know, which happened a lot in Central Asia, when Central Asia was trying to reinvent itself post-communism, post-socialism, uh, whether it was in the former fi uh, you know, five Soviet republics or Mongolia, which was a parallel Soviet uh, you know, socialist or communist state. Uh, this idea of, of who are we? What is our national identity? Who are we? You know, what did the Soviets try to erase about us? Right? So the, the pastoral nomadic component is one, Genghis Khan. That's why you see statues of Genghis Khan everywhere. And then this idea of, you know, we were linked through these, these kind of belief systems as, as well. So there's a place in Mongolia today, even though it's a modern country and the capital is booming and it's urban and it's full of KFC and all of that, um, there's still sort of this idea that, that somehow what links mo modern Mongolians or Kazakhs to their past is this pastoral nomadic uh, identity. And I think, you know, uh, shamanism also, we tend to think of belief systems as mutually exclusive. So we tend to think of Islamic, uh, pre-Islamic and Islamic, somehow as if they are two different, uh, there's a dichotomy there, right? Well, it's not. Islam just becomes, in this example, another layer <laughs> that is blended on top of you know, already existing layers. So I'll give you a good example of that. So there's an ovu in Mongolia, which is shamanic. Sometimes it's dressed up with a torana, or a Buddhist torana. So it's a kind of blending of shamanic and Buddhism in Mongolia. And that's a Sufi shrine. That's an Islamic shrine. People do exactly the same thing at both shrines. They circumambulate and put prayer flags. They just have a separate identity, but it's exactly the same. Physi you know, phys the physicality of the place is very, very similar. Uh, so anyway. So shamanism uh, among pastoral nomads and then Zoroastrianism, uh, very, very important among the, the agricultural and in particular Iranian communities of uh, early Iranian communities of Central Asia. I don't really have to talk about Buddhism in this introductory lecture. There will be plenty of people. Monica Zinn will talk about Buddhism in, in, um, in Kucha uh, and, and Kizil, of course, Osmond, your well-beloved Osmond, Boperachi will talk about the links between Gandhara and um, sites in, in Western uh, China. Uh, but I do want to mention it because it is different. Buddhism crosses boundaries much faster than the religions I've mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and it moves you know, via trade uh, and the uh, adoption by the political elites from its place of origin, uh, India, into Central Asia, and then on to China. Uh, what's interesting about this map is that it denotes the, the movement of, of Buddhism alongside mercantile routes, which brings us back to the Silk Road. There's a very clear connection. If you map Buddhism and map trade, it's the same map, basically. It's the same chronology. So we know as merchants expanded, in particular Central Asian merchants, expanded their activities, right? in particular vis-a-vis -vis China, because they were uh, conducting trade overland uh, with, with China, you see Buddhism moving alongside it um, and becoming very, very popular along the Central Asian uh, Silk Roads. Now it's very important again uh, in, in terms of maps to understand that Buddhism too is, uh, there's, there's no linear progression. 
So this map would probably have you go from India into Western Central Asia into the Tarim Basin and then on to China. And then everywhere Buddhism moves, it kind of puts down roots until it gets to China. Uh-uh, it went to China first. It skipped the Tarim Basin altogether. Tarim Basin was just a place where you could feed your animals and you, know, you got nourishment. It goes to China first. Only in the third century does it get to the Tarim Basin, maybe second century. And that has to do a lot with uh, the Gandharan connection, but Osmond will talk about that. I don't want to take up too much, too much time. Um, so there are wonderful sites uh, in Afghanistan, in Uzbekistan, in the Tarim Basin um, that underscore this very rich Buddhist history of the region. So this is a stupa at Mesainyak, and you may know about this site. This was the site south of Kabul, a very important Buddhist site that was threatened by a copper mining venture uh, where uh, China and the Afghan government invested billions of dollars to extract uh, copper from this mine, you know, right on this, on this site. Uh, but Afghanistan is littered with Buddhist monuments. So um, I give you a very beautiful Dipankara Jataka from Mes Anyak, third century. Uh, it's now in Kabul uh, Museum. It's very similar to other Jataka uh, steles that were found in uh, Afghanistan. Um, some of you may not know, uh, those who have traveled to former Soviet Central Asia will know, uh, but if you cross the border, uh, from Afghanistan across the Oxus River, you have wonderful Buddhist sites. So in Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan, this is Faya Stepe uh, at the uh, city of Termes in southern Uzbekistan. Termes is right on the Oxus River. So it was a very important town in particular vis-a-vis -vis modern day uh, Afghanistan. And it's a wonderful uh, Buddhist art uh, from, that, from that time period. Now, one of the important things to understand is, uh, or, or to question, or a question that should be posed, this popularity of Buddhism, did it trickle down to the masses? Right? So merchants supported it, elites supported it, they pumped a lot of money into the establishment of Buddhist monasteries. But does that mean that most of this region became Buddhist? This is something that is very difficult to ascertain. Because we follow Buddhism by looking at monumental remains. We don't know who practiced it, who, who went to these monuments. Is it just, you know, the plaque on the door of the, the rich merchant? <laughs> um, or did most of the population, in particular the Iranian population, remain Zoroastrian or Mazdaic? And this was just kind of an overlay. Buddhism of the hearth, I think, is going to be a very important area of focus. You know, in urban centers where people lived, can you find traces of their religious beliefs? Um, so that's a question that we ask ourselves. Uh, but uh, plenty of evidence uh, that many, in particular, uh, the upper echelons of society supported Buddhism for at least a thousand years. And then if you cross the Pamirs into western China, you have the beautiful cave temple sites. This is Kizil, again, uh, Monica Zin will talk about this, 4th to 8th century cave site uh, along the northern Taklamakan route with beautiful, beautiful paintings. Uh, I know we tend to focus a lot on Dunhuang, and I think we do because it, it somehow, Dunhuang is seen as much more part of China or the Western end of, of China proper, if you will. And Kizil is much more Indo-Iranian and slightly away, you know, slightly in this desert region. So what I'm hoping, you know, by inviting Monica to come, she's the expert on, on Kizil, uh, has an enormous database of paintings. Uh, beautiful paintings, and this blue is lapis lazuli, came from Afghanistan, was made into pigments, and used quite heavily at, at Kizil, uh, and it's quite a dynamic uh, site. 
And then Dunhuang, of course, uh, for a thousand years from the fourth to the 14th century, uh, one of the largest Buddhist settlements and monasteries of the uh, Silk Road. And again, Buddhism uh, was very successful in transplanting itself across borders. And that had to do, I think, because it wasn't tied to birth, it wasn't tied to caste. Uh, you could take refuge in the Buddha quite readily and quite easily. You could even transplant it onto another identity. It didn't matter. Right? Um, so it moves quite rapidly, uh, in particular when it's supported by the mercantile and political elites. Now, I wanted to also talk about other religions uh, or have somebody talk about other religions because uh, they're the, the experts uh, this fall. One of them is Manichaeism. It's a quintessential Silk Road uh, religion. It's really a blend of Zoroastrianism, Christianity, Hinduism. If there is a, yeah, a quintessential Silk Road religion, then Manichaeism would be it. Uh, it's also a very strange religion. So I'm not at all surprised it died out because it's very hard to comprehend its rules and regulations. But again, uh, Susanna Gulaski will be talking about Manichaeism because she'll be focusing on the Manichaean texts and, and paintings. So Manichaeism is a Silk Road religion. It spreads from Persia after the persecution of Mani uh, into uh, Western Central Asia and then ultimately into the Tarim Basin, but also uh, in to China. And again, um, Central Asia, it's one of these, these, there's almost no state religion in Central Asia. It's always been a patchwork of kingdoms. And so there was never really a kind of top-down approach when it came to what people should believe. So, for example, uh, the Sasanians, ultimately, not all Sasanian kings, but one in particular, uh, would pers persecute you know, non-Zoroastrian kind of communities who are professing different types of religions or new interpretations. And Central Asia would become the home of those <laughs> communities, ultimately, because there was nobody. It, it, it really it's this place where you can go and blend, right? Um, it was funny thinking about what Peter said about my background. I learned a lot, Peter, about myself. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, about Holland and Reformed Protestantism and this idea of Dutchness and particular idea of who we are, what your identity is, and how I loved, and still do, coming to America. <laughs> because ultimately, even though, you know, I have blue eyes, I could blend, I could, you, uh, the name gives it kind of away. Uh, that I was not Dutch. Um, and you do feel, you know, you feel that kind of, uh, even though it, it's, it doesn't manifest itself physically or... or um, and I feel the Central Asia is like a bit like, you know, America. It's sort of everybody's from somewhere else or we have kind of this collective. Uh, whether it's a myth or not, uh, right, and one could argue uh, at times, um, there is this understanding that we all have this, these backgrounds that are incredibly diverse, and yet we all are here, you know, kind of together. So that's what I feel about Central Asia. So Manichaeism, uh, on the map, Uyghur Manichaeism, uh, the Uyghur kingdoms, uh, especially the early ones, uh, were quite uh, in favor of Manichaeism, so it actually has uh, a lifespan of a couple of centuries in the Tarim Basin. And these are some of the uh, art objects uh, that relate to, to Manichaeism. So these are the Manichaean texts, in particular the Turfan region in, in Xinjiang, uh, where uh, the Uyghur kingdoms uh, were located, uh, the medieval Uyghur kingdoms were located. You find uh, different Manichaean texts. It was a Gnostic religion, a lot of emphasis on passing on the teachings and study, and it's very, and I think the monasteries uh, function very similar to the European medieval monasteries, where you, you think of, you know, these, these um, monks, uh, monastics, copying texts over and over again. So you have these images of these Manichaeans dressed in white in front of a piece of paper and a pen, faithfully copying the Manichaean. Uh, tradition. All the way to China, this is Shenzhou, uh, 
Zhou, China, 12th century, there's a temple with a statue of Mani, almost Buddhist-like, right? very close uh, in terms of its. Um, another uh, leaf of a Manichaean text that, that Monica Zinn will talk about, but I wanted to show you the flip side of this one. So it's 8th, 9th century, also from Turfan. What do you see in the middle? Yeah, that's Ganesh, that's Shiva, there's Brahma, there's Vishnu, and there's Bor Avatar. So Imani, Imani, the, the, the history of Mani sort of suggests that before, of course, things went wrong in Persia, he traveled quite a bit. And he was, he absorbed, wherever he went, he absorbed sort of ideas from those traditions. And maybe that was, you know, uh, something that then became you know, a reflection of a Manich Manichaean pantheon, but it very much looked like the Hindu uh, pantheon uh, to me. The last one um, I wanted to talk about uh, before I get to, to the Islamic period uh, is Nestorian Christianity or the uh, Syriac church, the church of the East. Um, everybody know the sort of backstory about Nestorian Christianity? No? Uh, so Nestorius, 5th century, um, well, there's a long history, but I'll, I'll condense, you know, I'll, I'll distill it to, to the particular point. He refused to believe that um, there were uh, uh, two natures of Christ, right? human and divine. It's like there's only a divine nature of Christ. Well, if you only have a divine nature of Christ, then Mary goes out the window. Because Mary is the, right? So he started to push the envelope uh, in terms of understanding right, the, the, the kind of core of the, of the, let's say, the Christian triad. Um, and was persecuted for it, was declared a heresy. And so Nestorians were pushed out of, you know, Constantinople, the Western, you know, the, the Near East, the, 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 West, the Eastern Mediterranean. And then Nestorians went into the Near East and then on to Central Asia and well into China. So if you go to Dunhuang, for example, in the museum at Dunhuang, you probably, some of you have traveled, will have seen it, uh, the Syriac manuscripts with a portion of the Psalms. Uh, and then the Nestorius, Nestorian cross uh, that was found in the northern portion of the site. So there are references, uh, you know, it's archaeological material that indicates sort of the, the establishment or at least um, the, the intersection in the Tarim Basin community and the Nestorian uh, Christian community. Uh, there's a painting from Turfan, from a temple at Kocho, that depicts uh, what everybody sees as Palm Sunday, uh, with the priest standing in front of the, the acolytes. Um, the, 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 the leaves that they're holding, they're hard to see in this, in this image, but most scholars uh, have interpreted it as, as a, as a uh, representation of um, a, a Syriac theme. I just was in Xi'an on this Fulbright trip, uh, and there's the famous Nestorian stele in Xi'an, so there was a community of Nestorians. Uh, the stele dating to the 8th century AD, it's written primarily in Chinese, but there's a little bit of Syriac uh, at the bottom. Uh, it talks about the history of the, the Nestorian community as it enters into uh, China. Uh, it's made of limestone and about uh, three meters high, and you can see uh, the cross on top of the, the Chinese uh, characters. Uh, and this is the whole stele, and then you have the Syriac on uh, the left. So 
Zoroastrian tradition, shamanic traditions, you have Buddhism, you have Manichaeism, you have Nestorian Christianity. And as I mentioned early on, when you look at the cultural landscape of Central Asia today, predominantly Muslim. So ultimately, you have the expansion of uh, the Islamic tradition. And initially, it comes with political expansion after the, you know, the prophet, uh, under the Umayyads, and ultimately the Abbasids. Uh, you get Arab dynasties that are expanding their power from the Arabian Peninsula into Central Asia. So here again, the Pamirs are a kind of barrier um, to consider, and this is why physical, you know, understanding physical geography is important. Um, in Western Central Asia, by the eighth century, Islam starts to become well established and starts to slowly overtake the Buddhist uh, tradition. So over time, and we like to, to invent terms, so there was Turkification with the changing of the languages and we call this process Islamicization, right? Where you get the slow expansion of the Islamic uh, tradition. Now, it's important to understand that even though you have a very, the, the early sort of military conquest uh, of Central Asia, is that most of the diffusion of Islam uh, was gradual uh, and through various pathways. There was, of course, the conversion of the political, local political elites that then want to link themselves with, you know, the powerful dynasties of the Near East, uh, the trickle-down effect of that, uh, but also a lot of mercantile activity. So Islam is very much like Buddhism. Um, if, you, if you really sort of start to focus on sort of the way that they traveled, it really follows Buddhism quite uh, effectively. It's sort of as if it builds on that network and then, you know, moves. Um. The other reason why I say trade is when you map, if you go to China, and I know I'm not talking about China a lot because I'm trying to focus on Central Asia, but if you look at uh, the earliest Muslim communities in China, uh, in particular the coastal areas, you'll see them in the port cities. So Guangzhou, the earliest Muslim communities, and they settled as traders. So the Chinese Muslims of today, Hui Muslims in China, not the Uyghur, the Hui Muslims, see themselves as descendants of those Arab and later Persian traders that settled in uh, the port cities of China and then intermarried and established the Muslim uh, communities. So again, I think you know, a lot of history has sort of looked at Islam as you know, in, in the context of the sword, quote unquote. Uh, what we find is really that this is a gradual sort of uh, transition. That doesn't mean that you know, uh, when uh, dynasties take over territory that there's no uh, military campaigns and no violence. But in terms of the popularity, it's very similar to Buddhism, Buddhist popularity over time. And just to give you some examples, and um, Nile Green uh, actually will talk a lot about Afghanistan, uh, I think it's the last lecture, uh, and he will talk about Buddhism in the context of Islamic uh, Afghanistan, so that should be a very wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, Bukhara, Uzbekistan. So, and then Western China, and this is very interesting, a slightly different trajectory because you have the Pamir Mountains, so there's no Arab conquest east of the Pamirs. Uh, so what happens in what is now Xinjiang is that in the 10th century, one of the local rulers called Satuk Bugra Khan, you can see his name at the bottom. He converts to Islam. And this is the initial phase of Islam transplanting Buddhism in the Tarim Basin. And slowly from Kashgar, which is at the western end of what is now Xinjiang, Islam moves to the east, ultimately Islamicizing the Uyghur, taking over. You know, the Uyghurs who are Manichaean, then Buddhist, now they are Islamic as as well. Oh. And there, picture of uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, most of the population, Uyghurs are Muslim, 
Uzbeks see themselves as Muslim, uh, Turkmen, Tajik, uh, Afghans. Uh, majority, not all, majority populations are now uh, Islamic in, in Central uh, Asia. So then I wanted to come back to the quote, right? Because uh, if the quote didn't make sense, when I first showed it to you, perhaps now, thinking about what I just said, it makes more sense, right? Central Asia being the Western Turco-Iranian part of Inner Asian heartland, whose indigenous population consisted of various Iranian peoples, most of whom have now been Turkicized, right? Except for Afghanistan and Tajikistan, and whose growing Turkic population has to various degrees assimilated its indigenous Iranian culture, gradually incorporated into the Islamic world, it is set apart from its Islamic neighbors by a unique blend with the world of the nomads. So in Central Asian Islam, and this is sometimes not popular when you say things like that to some people, uh, there's a lot of pastoral nomadism. <laughs> there's a lot of Buddhist traditions. You go to uh, Islamic shrines in Xinjiang, and you look at people uh, worshiping at these sites. Sometimes they worship uh, at sacred trees. They hang prayer flags in sacred trees. Sometimes they put animal carcasses on stone kerns to mark uh, a very spiritual site touched by some Sufi saint or, or sheikh. Right? They define themselves as Muslim. <laughs> they see this as a Muslim tradition. But when you step away from it and you think of it in relation to sort of the religious history and other traditions in the area, you can tell what the elements are that set that kind of Central Asian environment apart from what you see in, in other places. Um, so I think, you know, and it's quarter past 12, so I, I think this is what I want you to understand about Central Asia, right? These are sort of the the main, this is, this is how I would paint sort of the, the, the general canvas, the cultural canvas and the physical canvas of this region. And each of these scholars that have been invited will focus on one of these aspects that I've talked about today. And hopefully, you know, you'll keep, and maybe you'll discard it altogether, but maybe you'll keep some of what I've said in your mind and that will be like the red thread that kind of con connects all these different topics and themes um, through space and time, right? So, thank you very much. <laughs>